This video is dedicated to Constance Mary Pott, founding mother of the Francis Bacon Society and untiring champion of Francis Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare works. I am here to talk to you about The Misfortunes of Arthur, a play that has been shrouded in obscurity for more than 400 years, which is of the greatest importance to Francis Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare plays. In normal circumstances, any drama with any kind of proximity to the Shakespeare plays, however remote or tenuous, would usually attract the attention of biographers, editors and commentators in their battalions, who would individually and collectively scrutinise it for all traces, echoes, parallels, mutual links and any and all connections to the hallowed Shakespeare canon. One suspects the principal reason why this play is suppressed or passed over by the standard Shakespeare source works is because the name of Francis Bacon is linked to its authorship and production, a historically important play which predates and has undeniable links to a large number of Shakespeare plays. The untold importance of Bacon's connection to the misfortunes of Arthur makes it unique in the history of the authorship of the Shakespeare canon. And it is the reason why the, why the play has languished in the forgotten hinterlands of orthodox scholarship for the last four centuries. The silence and systematic suppression is all the more telling when we consider after William Shakespeare, Bacon is the most scrutinised writer in English history. Surely there is no need to state to any literary student that the first appearance of the name of an author in print is a biographical and bibliographical milestone in the canon of any great historical figure of, or man of letters. Thus, one may reasonably expect that Bacon's biographers and editors would have devoted an enormous amount of energy and space to the minute scrutiny of the first work to which his name is attached in print. Yet in the words of his recent biographer and editor Alan Stewart writing in 2012, Bacon's first appearance in print has received surprisingly little attention from scholars of his work. There is no mention of the play by his first editor and biographer Dr Rawley, who lived with Bacon for the last 10 years of his recorded life from 1616 to 1626, in the first English biography of his Rosicrucian master, nor is there any mention of it in any of the other editions or collected editions by Dr Rawley of Bacon's works. On the death of Dr Rawley, many of Bacon's letters and manuscripts passed to his second editor, Thomas Tennyson, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury, who published some, but certainly not all of them, in Baconiana. Like his predecessor, Dr Rawley, our second Bacon editor, Archbishop Tennyson, makes no reference to the work marking Bacon's first appearance in print. A new 197-page biography entitled The Life of Francis Bacon by the Scottish poet and dramatist David Mallet appeared in 1740. At the end of this new life, its author Mallet provided a 30-page catalogue of all my Lord Bacon's writings as they are printed in the edition of 1740. By this he meant his own four volume edition of the works of Francis Bacon with several additional pieces never before printed in any edition of his works also published in 1740. The multi-volume edition contains more than 30 of Bacon's major and minor works as well as many of his occasional writings, letters and speeches. But Mallet does not once refer to Bacon's first appearance in print in The Misfortunes of Arthur. His life of Bacon furnished the later 18th century editions of Bacon's works and informed other 18th century biographical accounts of Bacon, none of which mention the misfortunes of Arthur. In contrast to the silence of his forebears, in the 14 volume The Letters and Life and Works of Francis Bacon, his great standard editor and biographer James Spedding adopted a method of delivery his subject would have greatly admired. Instead of the previous crude but effective method of silence and suppression by his earlier editors and biographers, 
Spedding, in that masterful way of his, actually refers to the invisible plane passing, but deftly without even mentioning its title. Nor is there any trace of it in the index, with such understatement and brevity that one can only stand back in quiet admiration and applaud. Parliament was dissolved on the 23rd of March 1586-7 to and from this time we have no more news of Bacon unless it be worth while to mention that he assisted in getting up the mask which was presented to the Queen by the gentlemen of Gray's Inn on the 28th of February following till after the defeat of the Armada. The first 20th century single edition of the philosophical works of Francis Bacon, edited by J.M. Robertson, published in 1905, also makes no reference to the misfortunes of Arthur, nor so in his bloated and tedious The Baconian Heresy, a work marred by selective suppression and gross misrepresentation of the facts and the evidence. The first extensive one-volume anthology of Bacon's writings since Robertson by the modern Bacon authority Professor Brian Vickers is of much more interest. Under the title Francis Bacon, a critical edition of the major works, it was first issued by Oxford U University Press in 1996. The edition includes several of Bacon's major works, The Advancement of Learning, The Essays, The Utopian Rosicrucian New Atlantis, and reprints 16 other works which were not otherwise readily available. One of the important and valuable features of this inexpensive and accessible work is it re uh, reprints a series of dramatic devices and entertainments written by Bacon that Professor Vickers rightly points out are little known outside the pages of Spedding's seven volume edition of the Letters and Life of Francis Bacon. The dramatic devices were written shortly after the misfortunes of Arthur, beginning from the early 1590s. Of tribute, or giving what is due, six speeches for a device for the Gray's Inn Revels, which saw the first performance of the comedy of Errors, and of love and self-love, all of which were originally part of Bacon's collection of manuscripts, known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which originally held copies of his Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. In addition to printing these texts, Professor Vickers provides his readers with very extensive annotations explaining their background and context. One would have thought, considering the detailed attention he devotes to these Bacon dramatic devices and entertainments, he might have assigned a similar proportion, proportionate amount of energy to the Baconian drama immediately preceding them, the one which witnessed Bacon's first appearance in print. However, all that Vickers had to say about the misfortunes of Arthur is inappropriately relegated to a footnote in his introduction. Bacon's first appearance in print was as one of a group of grazing students who devised dumb shows performed before each act of Thomas Hughes's The Misfortunes of Arthur, 1588, a play which made a peculiar blend of Arthurian legend, Geoffrey Monmouth, and Senecan tragedy, Thyestes. The play was published in an edition entitled Certain Devices and Shows Presented to Her Majesty by the Gentlemen of Gray's Inn at Her Highness's Court in Greenwich. A note at the end of the text records, the dumb shows were partly devised by Master Christopher Yalverton, Master Francis Bacon, Master Francis Flower. Whatever Bacon's contribution, scrutiny of these five extended stage directions discloses no individual hand and I have not thought them worth re reprinting. In the recent modern biography of Lord Bacon by Professors Alan Stewart and Lisa Jardine, a work described on its jacket as the definitive life of one of the great figures of English history, its index lists more than 40 of Bacon's writings referred to and discussed in their detailed text. One work, however, is conspicuous by its absence, the work to which Bacon's name first appears in print, The Misfortunes of Arthur. The same can be said about the most recent full-length biography by Professor Robert P. Ellis, entitled Francis Bacon, The Double-Edged Life of the Philosopher and Statesman, published in 2015. 
He refers to and discusses a whole range of Bacon's writings, but can find no room for any notice of the misfortunes of Arthur. The first printed work with the name of Francis Bacon attached to it is also passed over in complete silence by Marco Paltonin in his long and detailed biographical entry for Bacon in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, published by Oxford University Press 2004-2021. Spread over some four centuries, the circumstances surrounding the misfortunes of Arthur has, it seems, come full circle. Just as his first editor and biographer, Dr. Rawley, has failed to mention the first work to which the name of his master is attached, the milestone work does not even warrant a single entry in the indexes of the most recent biographies by Jardine and Stewart and Professor Ellis, or given even passing mention by Paltonin in what will most probably be the most widely read account of his life for many years and decades to come. The virtual silence surrounding the misfortunes of Arthur at the hands of Bacon's biographers and editors for the last 400 years was however finally broken in the first volume of the Oxford Francis Bacon, co-edited by Alan Stewart with Harriet Knight, entitled Early Writings 1584-1596, published by Oxford Clarendon Press in 2012 in which the misfortunes of Arthur finally receives some of the commensurate attention its historical importance so clearly merits. In the volume, its editors devote a fair amount of space to examining the misfortunes of Arthur. The edition includes an 18-page discussion of the play with helpful footnotes and commentary, and they also print the text of its five important dumb shows. Yet, as welcome as his scholarly and formative work is, in the usual orthodox tradition, Bacon's editors present The Misfortunes of Arthur as a work of multiple authorship. And in their very careful use and non-use of sources, Stuart and Knight very consciously do not once connect or link this Baconian drama to any of the Shakespeare poems and plays. The original 1588 edition of The Misfortunes of Arthur names eight collabor collaborators in connection with the play. The drama is presented as having been chiefly written by Thomas Hughes of Gray's Inn. The text is preceded by a verse introduction penned by Nicholas Trott running to five pages. Two of its speeches are headed, a speech penned by William Fulbeck Gentleman and pronounced instead of Gorlois, his first speech penned by Thomas Hughes. And secondly, one other speech penned by the same gentleman and pronounced instead of Gorlois, his last speech penned by Thomas Hughes. The edition is brought to a close as follows. Besides these speeches, there was also penned a chorus for the first act and another for the second act by Master Francis Flower. The dumb shows were partly devised by Master Christopher Yelverton, Master Francis Bacon, Master John Lancaster and others, partly by the said Master Flower, who with Master Penruddock and the said Master Lancaster directed these proceedings at court. The presentation to the Elizabethan world that the misfortunes of Arthur was a joint enterprise of eight individuals, mainly written by Thomas Hughes, nearly all of whom still remain obscure figures to the recorded page of history, with the name of Francis Bacon hidden away on its last page, is merely a carefully constructed charade by its sole author. Aside from Bacon, none of these individuals are known to have written any kind of dramatic entertainment, mask or, mask or play during their entire lifetimes. In 1908, Alice Chambers Bunting discovered in a collection of letters and papers belonging to Anthony Bacon in the British Library, a poem referring to the misfortunes of Arthur, which she reproduced in Baconiana, which at a single stroke collapses this carefully crafted illusion of its multi-authorship. O second Arthur bred in British brain, Strange was thy birth indeed, and giant-like much pains thy mother bid, with patience mild. One noosed thee, another made thy cheek, and yet no doubt that thou art but one man's child. But whoso wash thy face with printer's ink, speck on the rest, I know well what I think.
This important and intriguing poem discovered by Chambers Bunton, printed in the 1908 edition of Baconiana, did not disturb the pages of orthodox scholarship for nearly three quarters of a century, until, in 1983, Janet Cohen and Joanna Udall, scholars from King's College London, reproduced the poem in what they believed to be for the first time in Notes and Queries. I am not in a position to, de to determine whether the Baconiana article was actually known to Cohen and Newdale, or whether it was known to the modern editor of The Misfortunes of Arthur, Brian J. Corrigan, who says in reference to the poem that it was discovered as recently as 1983. Thus, in both cases, it seems conveniently not. Pointedly, Chambers Bunting wryly comments that the poem pokes fun at the numerous parents the misfortunes of Arthur possessed and wonders which of them so wash thy face in printer's ink, which is a very happy expression. The striking phrase also caught the attention of Cohen and Udell, whom thought it probably referred to the person who saw it through the press, and someone obviously did, as the British Library copy contains a number of cancel slips, three of which show substantive alterations of the kind likely to be made by the author. As Corrigan points out, the anonymous author of the poem is very obviously intimately acquainted with the strange-like birth of the play, its printing history, and witnessed its performance, and was on familiar terms with Anthony Bacon to whom it was sent. The first line of the poem appears to describe the author of The Misfortunes of Arthur as a second Arthur bred in British brain, referred to in the next line as mine host, who himself a prophet proved. If by mine host, as Corrigan suggests, Antony's brother Francis is meant, then when he first sang, suggest it was Bacon who conceived the drama. Thus, from the beginning, it seems clear that the anonymous author of the poem places Bacon at the centre of the creation and production of the misfortunes of Arthur, which is described as this British bard's surpassing work. The second verse continues this theme of revelation. Strange was the birth of the play, and indeed giant-like, which probably refers to the eight collabor collaborators named in the 1588 edition, where three people in particular, particular were said to have been involved in its composition. One noosed, and another made thy cheek, before the killer line, and yet no doubt thou art but one man's child. Astonishingly, both Janet Cohen and Joanna Udall of King's College, London, in The Critical Misfortunes of Arthur, and Brian J. Corrigan, editor of the most recent edition of The Misfortunes of Arthur, pass over this line in absolute silence. Bacon's sole authorship of The Misfortunes of Arthur is confirmed by a number of Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers found on the title page of the play, which does not carry the name of the play itself. In his Advancement of Learning, Bacon presents a number of cipher systems which he used in his acknowledged works and his Shakespeare poems and plays to convey hidden information about his secret life and writings. On the title page of the 1588 edition of The Misfortunes of Arthur, there are a number of Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. Below the printer's device, there are eight block capital letters, at London, and four words printed in ordinary Roman type, printed by Robert Robison. The addition of the numbers in the date, 1 plus 5 plus 8 plus 7 equals 21, and then 8 plus 4 plus 21 equals 33, which is Bacon in simple cipher. The whole title page contains 211 letters, a split simple K cipher. 100 equals Francis Bacon in simple cipher and 111 Bacon in K cipher. The 211 letters, the addition of the date and the single printer's device 211 plus 21 plus 1 equals 233, which yields a triple cipher, 100, 133. Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon, Bacon in simple cipher. The whole title page has a total of 42 words. The word and total letter count plus the four numbers in the date, 42, 
plus 211 plus 4 equals 257. 100, 157, Francis Bacon, Fra Rosy Cross in Simple Cipher. Several scholars have highlighted the political allegory hidden beneath the surface of the misfortunes of Arthur. It is a political allegory of the historical and contemporary affairs between England and Scotland, which had dominated Anglo-Scottish relations from the outset of the Elizabethan reign, predicated upon the question of succession and centred around the towering figures of Queen Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots. The year before the first and only performance of the misfortunes of Arthur, Mary Queen of Scots had been executed on the 8th of February 1587 on the orders of Queen Elizabeth, to the enormous relief of her senior advisers led by Bacon's uncle Sir William Cecil and spymaster Sir Francis Walsingham, head of the English Secret Service, who at the time was working very closely with Francis and Anthony Bacon. A year to the month that Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed on the orders of Queen Elizabeth, the Misfortunes of Arthur was performed by members of Gray's Inn at Greenwich on 28th of February 1588, with its text printed only a few weeks later under the title Certain Devices and Shows Presented to Her Majesty. There are only three copies of the original 1588 edition known to exist. The only copy now held in the United Kingdom is in the British Library, with the other two copies now in the Henry E. Huntington Library and the Houghton Library at Harvard University in the United States of America. The Arthurian play itself has more than 20 named characters as well as a number of soldiers for the battle scenes, which centres on a plot in which King Arthur represents Queen Elizabeth and the usurper Mordred represents Mary Queen of Scots. In The Misfortunes of Arthur, the major characters are provided with counsel. Cador, Duke of Cornwall and Howell, King of Little Britain, are counsellors to King Arthur. Angerad and Fronia provide counsel to Guinevere. But by far the most prominent and important counsellor is Conan, the good and faithful counsellor to Mordred, in a play which was partly written and performed for the purpose of providing Queen Elizabeth with grave counsel and advice. In the almost amusing but pregnant words of Stuart and Knight in the recent edition of the Oxford Francis Bacon Early Writings, the misfortunes of Arthur might therefore best be understood within Bacon's ouvroir as one of the several pieces of counsel for the Queen included in this volume. The first of these pieces reprinted in their volume, printed just prior to the misfortunes of Arthur, is simply entitled Letter of, of Advice to the Queen, written by Bacon in circa 1584-5, three years before misfortunes, which shares very similar themes and concerns with the play concerning the security of the kingdom and the person of Queen Elizabeth. In the tract, we have Councillor Bacon advising Queen Elizabeth, and in the misfortunes addressed and presented to Queen Elizabeth, we have the faithful councillor, Conan, a near anagram of Bacon, who makes an appearance in something approaching 20 pages, representing between a fifth and nearly a quarter of the play itself. Intertwined with its preoccupation with civil war is the insidious theme of incest which poisons the family line and the body politic. From the argument, we discover that the lawless liaison between Euther Pendragon and Igerna produced an illegitimate son, Arthur, with the duplicitous cunning of Merlin who transformed Euther into the likeness of her husband, Gorlios, the Duke of Cornwall, whom he afterwards killed in battle. Her pregnancy also produced a twin sister, Anne, and many years later, when Uther was killed by Saxon poison, Arthur entered into an incestuous relationship with his twin, a lawless union which produced Mordred. Seventeen years after, the mythical Roman procurator Lucius Tiberius demanded a tribute, one due since the time of Julius Caesar, which Arthur refused to pay. Gathering the forces of 13 kings, Arthur crossed the English Channel to do battle, leaving behind the kingdom and his wife Guinevere in the care of Mordred. 
Having landed his army in France after nine years of war, Arthur sent the slain body of Tiberius to Rome for the tribute. During his absence, Mordred, with the assistance of Scylla, a British earl, usurped the throne and entered into an outlawed sexual tryst with his now lover Guinevere. Learning of Arthur's imminent return, and enraged by his nine years' neglect and her unbridled passion and sexual lust for Mordred, she oscillates between killing her husband or herself before finding religion and retiring to a nunnery. Or, as Sandra Billington puts it, like a Protestant monarch, Arthur returns to England after triumphant battles against Rome, only to find disorder at home. Guinevere had abandoned him in his absence for an incestuous marriage with his son Mordred, and, Lady Macbeth-like, plots with Mordred Arthur's death. In the second scene, while contemplating killing King Arthur in the same vein as Lady Macbeth, Guinevere calls on all evil spirits to come to her aid. Come, spiteful fiends, come heaps of furies fell, not one by one, but all at once, my breast raves not enough, it likes me to be filled with greater monsters yet. Later in the play, writes Sandra Billington, King Arthur muses on the vice which begot Mordred, an incestuous relationship with his sister. Like Gloucester in Shakespeare's Lear, he realises his sin has rebounded on himself and, like Lear, he has caused not only his personal but also his kingdom's ruin. This powerful theme of incest combined with internecine civil war is carried over into the early Shakespeare plays, written around the same time or shortly after misfortunes. Shakespeare's Henry VI watches in dismay as civil war begets monsters, much as incest was popularly supposed to do, with Professor McCabe adding that in Richard III all of Richard's personal relationships are shown to be unnatural. In his person, the victorious House of York conducts a civil war within a civil war. The conflated metaphor of sexual corruption and decayed politics representing the diseased kingdom in Misfortunes of Arthur, portraying Britain as sterile and worn from the ravages of civil strife, functions as the culminating artistic effect of this association between sexual licence and the body politic. It is similarly employed, observes Crosby, in Troilus and Cressida. The incest theme in Hamlet and Pericles has attracted a good deal of critical attention. Mordred's crimes, remarks Professor Fuwa in his discussion of the incest theme in The Misfortunes of Arthur, are consistently judged by other characters as strange, unnatural, monstrous, foul, impious, uncouth, the sort of labels conventionally applied to incest itself. Shakespeare's works bear witness to similar expressions in similar contexts in, in Pericles. He further adds that Mordred's tainted birth is closely associated with confusion and moreover a similar association of incest with confusion may be found in Hamlet where King Claudius is accused of his unnatural murdering of his kin and incestuous marriage with Gertrude. The sorrow and total devastation wreaked on the Kingdom of Denmark originates from Claudius's disorder of blood relationships and natural murder and incest. Professor Fuwa also draws attention to the fact that the image of the serpent applied to the usurping Claudius appears in the last dumb show of the misfortunes of Arthur, where, in a somewhat similar situation to Hamlet's dumb show, a king lies sleeping, a snake is drawing near to sting him, and a lizard steps in to save the king. In this dumb show, the snake signifies Mordred. In his full-length study of incest and drama, Professor McCabe at some length details the incestuous overtones in King Lear, and some of the other later Shakespeare plays do not escape his attention, including The Winter's Tale, of which he pointedly comments, the taint of incest hangs over the drama from the outset. 
before concluding with remarks that could also be approximated to Bacon's distinctive use of the incest motive in The Misfortunes of Arthur. The distinctive quality of Shakespeare's use of the incest motif is its restraint and subtlety, which on a wider scale equates natural order with all sorts of forbidden desire. The sources and Arthurian themes of the misfortunes of Arthur have been traced in The Rape of Lucrece, Venus and Adonis, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Richard II, Parts 1 and 2 of Henry IV, Henry V, The Merchant of Venice, and Arthurian references, allusions, and resemblances in the first part of Henry VI, Love Labour's Lost, King Lear, and The Winter's Tale, all masterfully blended with Senecan themes, ideas, and language that form the very lifeblood of Bacon's Arthurian drama. The Misfortunes of Arthur is the most Senecan influenced play in all of Elizabethan and Jacobean drama. The Misfortune of Arthur's editor, Professor Cunliffe, identified more than 300 lines translated and adapted from all 10 Senecan tragedies. The persons and influences that shape our lives and minds begins early, and Bacon was raised and surrounded by poets, writers and translators from his early childhood right through into adulthood and beyond. His love and extensive knowledge of the Roman philosopher, writer and playwright Lucius Annius Seneca was inevitable, as Seneca was Sir Nicholas Bacon's favourite author. In a poem written for his wife, Lady Anne Bacon, in 1558, in a time of his great sickness, he reveals how he took great comfort in Anne reading to him from her Tully, Cicero and My Seneca. In reading pleasant things to me, whereof profit we both did see, as witnesses can if they could speak, both your Tully and My Seneca. Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon arranged for Latin verses or sententiae gathered up from 59 different sources, chiefly from Seneca and Cicero, to be depicted above the wainscoting and portals in the long gallery at Gorhambury. They were grouped together under 22 subjects to prompt meditation and were assimilated by Francis in his formative years and adulthood that established a love of Seneca and in particular Senecan drama which stayed with him for the rest of his life. In his preparatory comments to The Misfortunes of Arthur, its editor, J.W. Cunliffe, states that it seems impossible to carry the borrowing of Seneca and material further. And for F.L. Lucas in Seneca and English Tragedy, it is the most slavishly Seneca of all English plays. But as the German critic Wolfgang Clemen pointed out, this was no mere slavish imitation. The Misfortunes of Arthur shows to a unique degree how far a playwright could carry the process of taking phrases straight out of Seneca and fitting them together like a mosaic. The object of scraping together exaggerated utterances of this kind from different plays by Seneca and piling them on top of one another in a single speech seems to be to produce an impression of frenzy and conflicting passions and, if possible, to outdo Seneca himself in the accumulation of purple passages. The Misfortunes of Arthur was published in 1588, around the same time as the early Shakespeare plays Titus Andronicus, the three parts of Henry VI and Richard III were being written. The umbilical Senecan connection linking the Misfortunes of Arthur, the most Senecan drama in the Elizabethan canon, and the early Senecan Shakespeare plays has been strangely ne neglected by both Seneca and Shakespeare scholars. Just as Bacon had rewrote Seneca in The Misfortunes of Arthur, rewriting situations, scenes and speeches, the modern editor of Seneca, Professor Boyle, states... Shakespeare plays rewrite Senecan scenes and speeches constantly.
In his Shakespeare and classical tragedy, The Influence of Seneca, Professor Maiola explores Seneca's influence on Shakespeare. He mainly focuses upon seven plays, Titus Andronicus, Richard III, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello and King Lear, as well as discussing the Senecan influence on Pericles and Cymbeline, A Winter's Tale and The Tempest. And just as Seneca provided Bacon with numerous rhetorical and thematic ideas in Misfortunes of Arthur, Professor Maiola points out, Seneca continually provides Shakespeare with clusters of rhetorical and thematic ideas that shape his articulation of the tragic experience. Throughout Shakespeare's career, we shall see Seneca provides an important paradigm of tragic style, character and action. His influence surpasses the narrow imitations of genre and inspires moments in comedy as well as trage tragedy, notably in A Midsummer Night's Dream. This early use looks ahead to much later practice as Seneca becomes finally for Shakespeare, as for Renaissance Europe, an important source of that new and fascinating hybrid tragicomedy. In his groundbreaking Fated Sky, the Femina Furens in Shakespeare, M. L. Stapleton addresses the intertextuality of Seneca, his ten tragedies containing the English translation of the Senecan tragedies with the Shakespeare canon. He explains how Femina Furens, Angry Women, featuring all ten of Seneca's plays that provide models found throughout the early Shakespeare plays, from The Taming of the Shrew, Titus Andronicus, the three Henry VI plays, Richard III, as well as The Merchant of Venice, through to the later plays of All's Well That Ends Well, Antony and Cleopatra and Cymbeline. In the years immediately following The Misfortunes of Arthur, just as he drew heavily on Seneca for his early Shakespeare plays during the same period, Bacon made use of Seneca's writings in many of his own works. The, polit the political tracts of an advertisement touching the controversies of the Church of England and observations upon a libel, his dramatic device of tribute or giving that which is due, and his legal tract argument in Chudley's case. His habit of reading and rereading Seneca's tragedies and prose works is also evidenced in his private notebook, notebook Promise of Formularies and Elegances, which produces a great many parallels with his Shakespeare plays. In the Promise, Bacon jotted down words and phrases from several of Seneca's prose writings and dramas, all of which were heavily drawn upon by Bacon in The Misfortunes of Arthur and throughout his Shakespeare plays. Bacon also quotes and refers to a wide range of Seneca's writings in the Advancement of Learning, which he was preparing and writing for publication through 1603 and 1604, the years that saw the publication of the first and second quartos of Hamlet. The Misfortunes of Arthur is arguably the first Elizabethan revenge drama with links to the greatest complex revenge drama in the whole of Western literature, The Revenge of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, a genre ultimately derived mainly from Seneca. The revenge tragedy is largely characterised by horrible and bloody excesses, murders and mutilations, the appearance of ghosts demanding revenge, the madness of the revenger, insanity or feigned insanity, which are evident in Seneca's major tragedies. Some of these devices were adopted by Bacon in his Senecan saturated Misfortunes of Arthur, with the theme of revenge in Hamlet the subject of his aptly titled essay of revenge. In her full-length study entitled Hamlet and Revenge, Eleanor Prosser describes the revenge theme in The Misfortunes of Arthur in some imp impressive detail, which I here only quote a small part. Revenge is forced into the play solely to intensify the atmosphere of misery and doom. Gorlois, a prologue ghost, calls for revenge, but the specific revenge he invokes is irrelevant to the play. He merely establishes the atmosphere of wild hatred and the general theme. Throughout the play, revenge, the work of cursed imps, is seen as the cause of all calamities. Typical is the treatment of Guinevere. Hearing of Arthur's return, she rages for revenge, calling on the fiends, as does Lady Macbeth. 
Throughout the play, motives of despair and revenge are capriciously attributed to all of the major characters, whether relevantly or not, merely to emphasise their misery. Even Arthur's decision to d defend his kingdom against Mordred is attributed to a desire for private revenge. As king, Arthur obviously has not only the right but the duty to crush rebellion. He rejects every appeal to justice, fame and honour by citing the conventional precepts and determines to leave the heavens revengers of my wrong. But when Mordred sends a challenge that taunts him with cowardice, Arthur at last decides to fight. The result is disastrous for both principles and the country. During the period from 1607 onwards, Lord Bacon turned his attention to his later Shakespeare plays, or, as others prefer to describe them, Shakespeare romances, the name given to Pericles, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. We know from his advancement of learning and numerous essays written during this period that Bacon was reading and rereading Seneca's prose and dramatic works, and inevitably Seneca the philosopher and dramatist formed part of his consciousness in his prose and dramatic works. The Shakespeare tragicomedies, writes Professor Myola, deploy Seneca's subtexts and draw... Upon his own tragedies, deeply inscribed with Senecan images of revenge, tyranny and furore. Hercule Furen continues to be an important text, but Shakespeare's debt to Senecan drama, in the end as in the beginning, is principally a matter of style, a matter of rhetorical pose and gesture, replete with a cluster of familiar images and motifs. And these tragicomedies often feature a character who works through Seneca and passion to spiritual agnoresis, to a change of heart that ultimately gives witness to a beneficent providence. The pattern is incipient in Pericles, clear in Cymbeline and the Winter's Tale, and transformed in the Tempest. The transformative Shakespeare play The Tempest, with its philosophical scientist Prospero Bacon orchestrating events, has been described as a revenge comedy, which sets up, observes Professor Boyle, the possibility for revenge and then substitutes forgiveness. Though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, yet with noble reason against my fury do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. At the end of Seneca's Medea, the Colchian's magic implements the most savage vengeance, and she herself departs the world in apathetic flight. In the Tempest's concluding display of its protagonist's tender affections, Prospero the magician inverts Seneca's ending. Abjuring his magic, he replaces vengeance with virtue and compassion and returns to the social world from which he has been expelled. In emphasising his forgiveness of the brother who has wronged him, I too do forgive thee, unnatural though thou art. I do forgive thy rankest fault. Prospero inverts the ending of Thyestes II. The year after The Tempest was composed and performed, Bacon saw through the press the second edition of his essays, which went through a number of issues printed for William and John Jaggard. It is no coincidence that The Tempest, described by Dr Yeats as a Rosicrucian manifesto, was placed first in the first folio of the Shakespeare plays, printed by William and Isaac Jaggard in November 1623, followed shortly after by a reprint of Bacon's essays for William's wife, Elizabeth Jaggard. The same year the Seneca-inspired Shakespeare plays were first published to the world, another work, a little less known to posterity, was also printed at London, which if known to Seneca, Bacon and Shakespeare scholars, has been studiously overlooked and ignored. This work, written by the lawyer, poet and author Thomas Powell, entitled The Attorney's Academy, is dedicated to the King and several others, including Francis Bacon. The reason this revealing dedication to Bacon is not reproduced by his editors, biographers and commentators 
is very obvious as it very obviously alludes to Bacon's secret authorship of the Shakespeare poems and plays, with its theatrical metaphor momentarily drawing the curtain back for us to have a little peek before promptly closing it again. O oh, give me leave to pull the curtain by that clouds thy worth in such obscurity. Good Seneca, stay but a while thy bleeding to accept what I received at thy reading. Here I present it in a solemn strain, and thus I plucked the curtain back again. A Senecan scholar from virtually the day he was born into a household of a Senecan statesman, with Senecan sententiae adorning the Gorenbury home he was raised in. Versed in all the Latin and English Senecan plays from his youth, concealed author of the most Senecan play in all Elizabethan drama, The Misfortunes of Arthur, and those Senecan-inspired Shakespeare plays. For 400 years, The Misfortunes of Arthur has been surrounded by silence and suppression. This relatively unknown historically important drama marks the first appearance of the name of the great poet, philosopher and dramatist Francis Bacon in print and is by definition unique in the canon of his acknowledged writings and marks a unique biographical and bibliographical milestone in the literary career of this great historical figure and man of letters. The important landmark drama, written, performed and published in 1587-8, immediately predates the Shakespearean era and is of untold importance in the history of his authorship of the Shakespeare plays. The Misfortunes of Arthur served, serves as a source for at least half a dozen of his Shakespeare plays and has moreover important and extensive links to more than half the Shakespeare canon. It is permeated with his Baconian Shakespearean DNA, whose salient themes repeatedly anticipates and echoes throughout the whole Shakespearean canon, from the first to the last. The Misfortunes of Arthur, Bacon's first unacknowledged Shakespeare play. Thank you for listening, and if you'd like any further information, please see the following slide.